Welcome to Inspired by Faith, the program of the Columbus Catholic Women's Conference. I'm Michelle Fanley, and I'm joined each program in the studio with my friend Emily Jaminette. This show is to help you be inspired by our Catholic faith, live out the gospel message, and deepen your relationship with Jesus Christ. We hope this show provides an uplifting 30 minutes to help refresh your soul and strengthen your faith. As it was born out of our friendship, we hope it encourages you to deepen and develop spiritual friendships with your sisters in Christ. Well, hello, Emily. Hello, hello. It is so great to be back in the studio. We've had a a small little break after our conference, and so now we're all rejuvenated and ready to go, and we have another fabulous guest for our listeners today. I cannot wait. This is going to be such a wonderful episode, and again, as we continue to meet these women and, and priests and religious that inspire us, you know, we just want to pass that on to the listener. Yeah, so many wonderful things out there. So it's an honor to bring on Regina Boy today. Regina is the author of Leaving Loneliness Behind. She is a licensed mental health counselor and marriage and family therapist. She is the founder of Boyd Counseling Services and a contributor to the Hallow app. Regina lives with her family in Orlando, Florida, where she assists with parish and diocesan marriage formation. So welcome, Regina. Thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear oh, you. Welcome okay. <laughs> to our show. I bet you it's a little warmer down in Orlando than it is here in Columbus today. Oh, yes. We are um, hitting hitting highs in the low 80s. Not fully summer weather for us yet, but but yes, warm, much warmer here. <laughs> yes, we're, we're happy to see the sun these days in Ohio. <laughs> Absolutely. I think a lot of Ohio came to visit you in Florida. <laughs> we love to migrate down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, You have a brand new book, Leaving Loneliness Behind, as well as an accompanying workbook. And this is just really a fabulous topic um, to delve into. But we'd like to know first, and we gave a formal bio, but would you share a little bit about um, yourself and your faith journey with us? Sure, absolutely. Like you mentioned before, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a a therapist, I'm my faith journey, you know, my I grew up um, kind of going around to different churches. My mom is Baptist and my dad is Catholic, so we got a variety of different denominations growing up. And then when my family moved to Florida, they my parents decided to put us into Catholic school. That was sort of, you know, they were researching, and that was one of the schools they were most impressed with. And so that's where I got introduced into the sacraments. So I wasn't baptized until I was about 10 years old. But I remember being in, um, you know, sitting there for communion during the, during the school masses and watching all of my friends go up to communion and just praying that prayer so um, honestly and saying, you know, Lord, I'm not ready to receive you, but only say the word and I shall, my soul shall be healed. So hoping one day that I could receive and be in communion with my friends. Um, but I would say a deeper conversion happened in youth group um, during my high school youth group where I really met the person of Jesus, fell in love with him in a deeper, unique way. And um, thanks be to God, sort of been on this faith journey ever since. So, Praise God. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And, you know, we're just really excited about your book, uh, Tackling the Topic of Loneliness. I think as we're so connected in this world, um, a lot of times we don't even realize that we are experiencing loneliness. And, you know, in your most recent book, you open up talking about the Surgeon General who said, during my years caring for patients, the most common condition I saw was not heart disease or diabetes. It was loneliness. So can you share a little bit about this inspiration and the importance of faith and just, you know, how this all kind of came together, this, this major topic of tackling loneliness? Yeah, I mean, uh, I work with a lot of couples and families over the years, and part of the inspiration for the book was really almost creating a relationship handbook and for any relationship, friendship, family members, romantic relationships. How can we help make sure people are getting the most and maximizing their connections so that they're really not feeling isolated in their experience? And I would say throughout the writing process, it sort of morphed more into that concept of loneliness, but it truly is a big, big need. I think the um, county of San Bernardino, California, I believe, recently, just a couple of months ago, just announced loneliness as a health epidemic, and I think they're the first county in the country to do so. So a lot of people are increasing their awareness about the impact of this on our mental health, our physical health, 
Um, and so I just think it's so important, and we have such a tangible resource. The people around us are a way to get out of it, so it's so solvable, and I think it's important to, for people to be aware of that. <clears throat> Thank you. It's, it is. You're right. It's such a solvable thing, but so many people are so lost. You know, and Emily and I have talked a lot about friendship with women and people. It's it's really sad to us. People sometimes say to us, like, I don't have any friends. And it's 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 shocking to see that so many um, people who really are truly, truly lonely and looking for those those authentic connections, which you say in the first chapter, this is the the antidote for loneliness is authentic connection. And you wrote that it's vital to our existence. So what can you tell a bit? What do you mean about authentic connection and how do people even start forming these connections? Yeah, you know, I really believe that we're created for community. We're made in God's image and likeness. And we believe in a God who is Trinity, who exists eternally in relationship as Father, Son, and Spirit. And so if we're made in His image and likeness, then that means we're designed to be in relationship as well. When you think about all those basic human needs for survival, food, shelter, clothing, I like to put healthy relationships as number four (laughs) for me. So we all need our food, shelter, clothing, but we also need healthy relationships in order to survive. It really is completely vital to our existence. So when you're talking about authentic connection, that ability to maintain a relationship and have that sense of belonging, where do you feel closeness with others? Do you feel like there's a community or something that you can identify with in a certain way? We want God to be our first moment and point of identity, but who are we as within my family? You know, we're, for example, we're the Smiths and we're hard workers, or who am I? Uh, to other people? do I Am I a giver? Do I have a gift of hospitality? Do I have a gift of service? Where do I find that sense of belonging? Maybe even in your CrossFit gym. And those are the ways that we have those senses of community and belonging in our churches, our small groups, as a way to connect and feel like we're existing, not as an island, but within relationship with others. Well, the word vulnerability, that's not a very popular word, is it? A lot of times, you know, when we look at our social media, especially, you know, we we look at people almost through this lens of perfection, right? Either, you know, they're not really sharing um, on this level of vulnerability, but it's also, you know, typed out exactly the way they want versus, you know, the difference of being vulnerable within relationships. And so maybe, um, you know, do you have this understanding you, you wrote um, in the book, to be vulnerable is to be exposed. To be vulnerable is to be fully alive. So maybe you could share a little bit more about that quote and then also what it relates to or how it relates to, for many of us, being vulnerable. You know, we don't really know what that means due to our, our means of communication with social media. Oh, yes. Vulnerability is tricky because it's almost a catch-22. You're darned if you do, darned if you don't. It's something that There's always risk involved when we're vulnerable. When we open up to someone, we don't know how that person is going to receive what we share with them. Are they going to be kind and compassionate? Are they going to ridicule us for what we share? So that's the first level of vulnerability. Then we have that additional piece of do we even know if this person can keep confidence or are they going to share something private with people that we weren't wanting them to share with? And so there's a lot of layers involved, and yet there's no way to guarantee when I risk a little bit, when I'm open up and vulnerable, I can't guarantee how that person is going to respond and what they're going to do with that information. And simultaneously, if we don't engage in these steps of vulnerability, our relationships can't become deeper. They can't become something that's fulfilling and where we feel that sense of closeness and belonging. When you think about all of the tiers of a relationship from stranger to acquaintance to colleague uh, to friend to best friend to family member to spouse, we have all of these deepening levels of intimacy. And the reason why you feel closer to some people than others, my bet is there was some exchange of vulnerability between you and that other person at various points along the way in your relationship. You learn about someone, you know more about them. And so it's kind of interesting because especially, you know, we had Lent not too long ago and coming out of that period and reflecting on 
the cross and the resurrection. It's kind of like we can't have the resurrection with the, with the cross without the cross, and that requires a little bit of stretching and vulnerability in order to gain that resurrection on the other side. For the social media piece, um, I think that it's tricky because people treat it in a couple of different ways. I think some people are over-vulnerable and maybe share things that um, aren't necessary for public consumption, and some people do. And at the, so it's tricky because sometimes I applaud people who are willing to be out there and risk in a certain sense, but also you have to honor and respect the level of relationship that you have with someone. So just because vulnerability is important doesn't mean I tell a random stranger that I'm passing in the street everything about my life story. But in a certain sense, somebody has to earn that level of confidence in order for you to be vulnerable. So we have to be prudent about that as well and discerning. I don't know. I hope that answers your question, but... Really well. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, you really provided such great clarity, and I do agree that sometimes we share too much, and then other times um, within the culture, we maybe we don't you know, open our heart in real life to anyone, but yet we pour out on social media, so there can be definitely that imbalance. But what, what great insight. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it can feel safer on social media because of that. There's less risk in a certain sense. It's very public, if, especially if you have a large community in your online presence. It's very public, but at the same time, there's less risk because you're not necessarily receiving the ridicule right away, maybe later on with, with comments and things, but it's a, it's a different dynamic, yeah. It's important to learn to navigate that and to be with that prudence. I love that that comment about thinking about your prudence in both your online and your personal relationship and learning when to be vulnerable and maybe when, when to hold back a little bit is an, an important piece of this. And I also love you talked in your book, what is so beautiful. There's a lot of, I'm sure there's lots of books on relationships, right? I'm sure if you went to the bookstore and there's a whole self-help but yours is specifically um, and beautifully Catholic. And you talked about the vulnerability of Jesus and how he continues to be vulnerable daily in the Eucharist so that he can be close to us. So can you talk a little bit about our relationship with, our relationship with God and our connection with God and how that helps us when forming these relationships? Yeah, I mean, our relationship with the Lord is, is the ultimate of all our relationships. And so first, we need to know our identity as beloved daughters, as beloved sons to God. And when we know this, right, we navigate our relationships with a bit more ease, where we know who we are, we can view others as the gift that they are. Um, certainly, it's not going to be perfect 100% of the time. People make mistakes, you know, when nobody's perfect. But when we view others as a gift, we're more willing to be receptive and open. We're viewing them as a person they are rather than using them. And when we're not feeling used, we're more, uh, that creates some emotional safety for that vulnerability. But the Lord provides a great example in the Eucharist of how much we can be extending ourselves and being vulnerable, even if that means getting hurt. It's unfortunately part of the Christian walk that we're that we're walking even though it's hard it's so much I think that's where a lot of healing can happen too when we're willing to go to that place again with prudence and in a discerning way <laughs> that's beautiful thank you for sharing about the Eucharist and um, you know you also shared in your book about just knowing our defense mechanisms and what triggers us and you know how do we unlearn our defense mechanisms and identify triggers help us as we learn to make more authentic uh, connections. And I, you know, one thing that I've been really meditating on this Lent is when our Lord, you know, allowed himself to go through those difficulties with his relationships and he continued to do um, the loving response, even though he ultimately would be hurt. So maybe uh, just, you know, what you could kind of speak to us women who've maybe been hurt in this and, and responding differently than we have due to our past hurts? Yeah, it's such a challenge because when we've been hurt, a lot of things are happening in a single split-second moment. And I want to differentiate because sometimes we can be triggered. I know that word gets thrown around, and so I want to just highlight that I'm talking about it in a very clinical way. I'm not just talking about random emotional 
emotionally charged word to accuse people of anything. But what I'm saying is there's a physiological response that happens. So, for example, if somebody was in a serious car accident and they are back in their car again driving down that same road, they could all of a sudden have a visceral response that they don't cause. They could, their heart could start racing again. They might hyperventilate or feel very tense and nervous about driving down that same road where the accident occurred or just getting back in a car in general. And the same happens in our relationships. When we've been hurt, when we've been been betrayed by someone, if something in a relationship dynamic feels a little familiar, feels like we're heading down a path where, uh, uh uh-oh, this is what happened last time when I was hurt, all of those emotions come rushing back without our control. And so we have to be able to identify that as the first step. Do you have a clenched jaw? Are you tight-chested? Are your shoulders tight? Are you, do you have rapid, shallow breathing? These are all ways to pay attention to, am I having that physiological response? And that's going to give us a clue. You know, why am I having this? Is it during a particular time of day? Is it when I'm around a particular person or engaged in a certain activity? And if that's the case, now we can start making a plan about how to work on those defense mechanisms. So. If I notice that my shoulders get really tight every time I'm with a particular person, now I can make a plan about, okay, how am I going to go? What headspace do I need to be in? Or do I need to remove myself from the situation? So either I can plan ahead of time and pray and do all of my breathing techniques or relaxation, self-care, whatever I need to do to face that person. But if I realize I'm caught off guard and all of a sudden it's happening in the moment, I can notice, wow, my shoulders are really tight. Maybe I excuse myself, come back so that I can be more charitable. And then also, you know, what can I do in the future? If this is something where it's a repeated betrayal, where somebody's not really considered at all, it's one thing to make a mistake, but it's another thing for somebody to be kind of a repeat offender in a certain sense and not really have any remorse or trying to reconcile in some way. Now we might need to consider what boundaries need to be in place to make sure that I have the ability to take some time to heal and recuperate and and provide that opportunity for the person to change as well. I love this. And I love this chapter in your book because you talked about um, yeah, people that who have had some serious betrayal, maybe they have had um, infertility in, um, infertility, or, or did write about infertility, but you talked about infidelity, or just some very serious things that um, some women are faced with that cross. Um, and you talk about, okay, forgiveness. So we can't right, talk about relationships without the importance of forgiveness and when, when to forgive and um when, you know, and that, that prudence of um, not just, you know, saying everything's okay and, and it's moving forward, but really um, forgiving and moving past things, but being able to, like you said, have those boundaries and um, good relationships. Right, absolutely. Forgiveness is helpful to the other person, but it's to us as well. And if we're trying to, again, walk that Christian walk, we are hopefully trying to emulate Jesus and his mercy but that doesn't mean we put ourselves in dangerous situations again and put ourselves around that abusive person necessarily, but we can forgive from the heart. We can forgive through a process of prayer while also maintaining those boundaries um, and really finding that disposition of freedom within our heart to where that other person or whatever the situation is isn't taking so much life and draining, draining us of that life. With that, you know, Does forgiveness, do you see that the forgiveness leads to healing or, you know, what, what's the role of, you know, strengthening and healing and and kind of being able to um, experience this new freedom, you know, from what's, what's of, you know, our past wounds? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, forgiveness really is freeing for the person who forgives because we have that emotional tie and that connection to the person who committed the injustice against us, whatever that situation is. And granted, there are real pains and results when somebody does do something hurtful that, again, we need time to process and get through. 
But when we take that journey and we get to a point where we're ready for that forgiveness and for true healing and freedom, it sort of takes away the weight and the burden of carrying the the shame, the impact of what's happened to you. It makes it a little more easy to live with and process. You've made sense of the situation in a way that helps you perceive the world a little bit differently and a little bit lighter. It doesn't make it go away. What's happened has happened. But the way you process that information is a lot more smooth and simple, so to speak. Now, you have done a great work um, with, in addition to the book, but you've also put in um, time to create a workbook and a video series. Um, So can you share with our listeners what are also in these supplemental pieces, how to use them, and where they can find them? Absolutely. So in the back of the book and the workbook, there is a QR code that you can scan when you purchase and watch the uh, accompanying videos. So there's a video for each chapter in the book. So I think that's a great way to do some type of book study, group study together of the book, watch the videos, have conversations about the content. And I think the workbook is a great opportunity for that as well if you wanted to do this in a group setting. I mean, it's about relationships. Why not go through the book in relationship with other people at the same time? But in the workbook, there are exercises that correspond with each chapter. So we dive deep into what we were just talking about, betrayal, for example. And there's opportunities for you to reflect on your own personal experiences, to journal those out, and to put in tangible tools and practices in place. So for whatever specific situation you want to reflect on in the workbook, you're going to get tools to implement immediately so that you can start overcoming that, taking steps towards forgiveness, processing your triggers, figuring out a plan of what you can do. So that way you... Um, can see the results in your own life. So I think the workbook's a great opportunity and a great supplement to the book for sure. I love the relationship roadmap. We had a really fun time in my house going through all these questions with all my kids. And I think even though you live with people, you think you know everything about them, but you would be surprised um, going through some of these questions, what you don't even know about your own family. Yes. Yeah. I think that is the, I love the roadmap questions as well. It's so fun. Um, because we sometimes assume we know everything about the people we're close to and things change over time or, you know, something, something new pops up and you think about it in a way that you hadn't thought of before. So it's such a fun way to, to have a competition about it so you know who the best, but also just really learn more about somebody else and make more capacity for that other person in your heart. What about doing this with your spouse? Oh, yes, 100%, hands down, I think it should absolutely be done with a spouse. Whenever I ask couples to do that, they, um, I usually uh, offer for them to keep score, right, and keep track of getting the right answer about the other person. So you can answer the question for your spouse, you know, say what your husband's favorite, you know, formal restaurant is or something like that and see if you get it right, give yourself a point. So that's kind of a fun way to have a date night and see who knows who the best. That's awesome. Can you please tell our listeners then where they can find your book, um, what your website is, um, and where all your materials are? The book is available at Ave Maria Press, AveMariaPress.com, and on Amazon. And uh, my website, you can find it there as well, ReginaBoyd.com. I'm on Instagram at Boyd Counseling Services. So if you want to come hang out with me there, we have a lot of fun there as well. Do you do um, group and individual counseling for people outside of um Florida? Yeah, so for anyone outside of Florida, we do coaching uh, for them, uh, but anyone inside the state of Florida, we can do counseling and therapy, absolutely. Okay, that's Mm -hmm. great news. We're always looking for great Mm -hmm. connections and great Catholic counselors to help to help connect with. So we are super grateful for you to spend your afternoon with us, Regina, and thank you for your amazing work. Yeah, you really have inspired us, Regina. You know, and part of it is not only getting women the right resources and tools, but to see, you know, what you've dedicated your life to, to conquering this, the sense of loneliness, but yet this conversation's gone a lot wider and broader than just loneliness, strengthening your relationship with your spouse, your children, you know, having a better connection with God, understanding the significance of the Eucharist. So I'm, I'm not only excited about your resources, but I'm excited about, you know, I'm glad I got a chance to know you. I know Michelle and I really enjoyed this time. So thank you. 
Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. I really, I really appreciate the time. Well, thank you, and God bless. God bless you. Well, that was so wonderful. I know we're gonna have to. Let's go through it. I'm gonna I go know. through it with my spouse. I'm, I'm very excited because initially, you know, loneliness. I kept thinking when she was talking, like sometimes you don't realize you even are lonely. Yeah. Because your days are so full. But just busyness, yeah. but not deep, intimate connections. So it's um, really a gift to delve into those relationships. So It yeah. is. It is. And, and this is something that it's a great tool that so, when someone opens up to you in your life, that they're experiencing loneliness and they're experiencing some of the symptoms of being lonely. It's wonderful to have, like she said, you know, even another tool. Hey, we're going to point you in the right direction you know, go yeah, connect. Come on over. Let's come do on this. over. Let's, yeah, we'll go through this workbook or we'll go through some of these questions or watch this video if you need. Sometimes it's hard to have that conversation, but sometimes you pop something or share a video uh, with someone here. Put this on and then let's talk about it, you know, so it's easy sometimes to use use the multimedia platforms to your to help with your discussions with your friends. You know, one thing I love, um, Michelle and Divine Mercy for Moms, we just talked about even just um, greeting people in the back of church, you know, and a lot of times there are very lonely people that are looking for just even a weekly connection with a smile or have a great week. Like it can even just being friendly within our own parish community, especially when you consistently see people at mass, you know, just making a little effort there. Yeah. It's, it, people are very um, isolated these days mm -hmm. more than we think with the connection of the internet. We have, have a very isolated society. Yeah. I'm so excited about Regina's work. I think we are very blessed to know her and, and support this well, mission. Well, let's close in prayer today. Great. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, you know my heart. You know that I'm a sinner, but you love me anyway. I don't understand your unconditional love, but I accept it. I treasure it. I bask in your love. Help me to allow your love and mercy to sink deep into my soul and the recesses of my being. Heal those old wounds that lie deep in my soul. I want to be pure and holy like you. Give me the grace and the desire to live for you and remain in you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Holy Spirit. Amen. And that was from Father Burke Masters, one of the Catholic Men's Conference speakers. So we thank you today for joining us on Inspired by Faith. We hope you are blessed and inspired by this episode. To find out more about the Columbus Catholic Women's Conference, visit ColumbusCatholicWomen.com. And to hear about more about our work, visit InspireTheFaith.com. <laughs>